got a red on top and a red on the bottom, and now you're taking uh, this acceleration difference and this acceleration difference. You're subtracting those. Then when you do the top-bottom swap, you subtract those subtracted numbers. And the equivalence principle signal, again, comes out, uh, comes out and everything, almost everything else cancels. Um, the attractiveness of the left-right swap between these pairs is that you can, uh, you, first of all, you get some cancellation simply because they are near to each other in the same gravitational gradient. But you also get, you, you, you enhance that and, and by robotically lifting the test masses on a pair of, pair of lifters that turn around and drop it down. So with a single shaft that moves up and down and rotates, uh, you can uh, exchange these test masses mechanically. And we plan to do that in Gen 3. Um, and we, we expect to have a swap time of the order of 10 minutes or so. We'll stop the bouncing, um, and do, do the left right swap, and go on measuring um, automatically. And um, so uh, the difference of the of the difference of differences in this configuration and that in this configuration gives you uh, a further cancellation of gravity gradient terms. So that now a time-varying gravity gradient has to vary in synchronism with your left-right swap in order to cause a problem, and there won't be much power from that frequency. Um, next. Uh, we went through this section already. So now we go down to near the end. Thank you. When I start talking about a space-based test. Yes. Uh, we've had several ideas for uh, Ways, ways to continue this experiment to higher and higher accuracy. One way, of course, is to do the best we can on the ground. Our goal is to better the current limit by an order of magnitude. But once we get there, we will, of course, look hard at the experiment and find out how we can do better. Um, and um, it would not be surprising to be able to push it significantly further because um, in principle, there, there are advantages to the space experiment in that you can simply turn the apparatus over without much penalty. But the swaps do very, very well at removing systematic error, the multiple differential swaps. And we will study them very carefully uh, when we get to that point. Uh, so um, we, we may do quite well on the ground, but there are opportunities for doing better with longer free fall which gives you a chance to measure a greater, a greater distance. Uh, and at the same time, as I say, in space, you can s flip the experiment upside down uh, without much penalty. Um, it's very difficult on the ground um, to, to turn the apparatus upside down. Uh, you can drop a tube from a balloon with freely falling, a freely falling test mass system inside it. And uh, you can have it be like its own spacecraft, so it can flip upside down during this period of free fall. You can get, I think it's 30 seconds of free fall before the air that the, uh, you drop, the you drop it, uh, an empty tube, an evacuated tube, uh, with this uh, experimental can inside. And the experimental can is a bit like a spacecraft. Uh, the, the tube is just a big steel tube that pushes the atmosphere out. And um, when it starts to get into denser air, having been dropped from the highest you can get it up with a balloon, uh, it's about 30 seconds. And you can divide that up into, say, um, uh, 10 three-second intervals uh, for, for flipping the experiment upside down. So you can get five complete top-bottom cycles that way. Um, I had the idea recently of sending up the experiment on a sounding rocket. Um, Free-flying satellites are very expensive. Uh, if you work on the space shuttle or the space station, you get funded sometimes for initial studies or told that you will be funded. You do not get funded to do science. Um, the space station has actually canceled all science experiments. So this, the, a free-flying satellite is an expensive proposition. It's hard to get there in one jump from uh, a little bitty uh, experiment in, in a couple of rooms at the Center for Astrophysics. So the sounding rocket seemed like a nice transition uh, in that way. It also seems to have a special line of funding. They have some sounding rockets that they want to send up. They want science experiments to put on. Well, I got a science experiment. So uh, while it's not a wonderful place to do the experiment, 
I got these accuracy numbers wrong. It's not a wonderful place to do an experiment. You can improve on the ground-based limit by a bit. And at the same time, you can demonstrate your hardware for, for uh, space. So it, it may be quite, quite, uh, quite an attractive option. Probably in the balloon, you can't do quite this well. I've said 10 to the minus 15, but it may not be quite that good. Um, this is more the statistical, the statistical uncertainty before the systematic error is, is accounted for. Same for this number, 10 to the minus 16. Maybe you only do 10 to the minus 15 in the sounding rocket. And you might go up a couple of times in the sounding rocket. They're relatively cheap. And uh, they're also a good way to train students. So uh, um, that's, that's got some nice advantages. Uh, and you, get, you can get hundreds of seconds of free fall. Um, and the, the, real, the real way to do it is with an orbiting uh, satellite. And um, <coughs> what we've, we've also considered a space station version, which has a longer duration of free fall, but it's got astronauts running around and, and making gravitational noise. And you won't get to fly at the center of mass of the spacecraft. Uh, troublesome problems like that. Uh, flying at the center of mass of the spacecraft is important from an orbital point of view because now your test masses are in, in orbit, celestial mechanics. So um, uh, you're really you're really best off with a specially designed satellite, and that's what many of us in the equivalence principle business would really like to get to. And maybe some of us will get to collaborate on this eventually because I'm good friends with the people at Stanford who are furthest along in this country on developing a space experiment, experiment called STEP. Next. Did I say anything? Oh, that's an extra slide. It's a backup. It was repeated in a lot of stuff that I said. So that's it. Um, we're having fun, uh, making progress. It's grindingly slow to get these gravity experiments to work because you're looking for very small forces, but um, it's fun. All of the manifestations of uh, temperature require equivalence violation, or is it just a subset? Um, I haven't heard anything about in theory. String theory, yes. Uh, but yes, EP, yes, EP yes, is required? Yes, EP violation, EP violation is required. Okay. However, you don't know how much. Okay. It might be 10 to the minus 33 or something. <laughs> they can produce very small numbers, these theories. There's a statement in Cliff. In Cliff, if you're interested in, in um, tests of, of general relativity, experimental tests of general relativity, there's a wonderful, um, uh, long, scholarly, very scholarly piece, which is still accessible uh, by Cliff Will on the web. It's called Living Reviews. Uh, Cliff Will is the author. Confrontation of general relativity with experiment, and I think there's a link to it off our web page, which is CFA www.cfa.harvard.edu slash poem. Poem is principle of equivalence measurement. So with one of those links, Google should get it for you. It's it's Cliff Cliff is an expert. And he makes this stuff very clear. It's wonderful to listen to if you ever hear a lecture from him. And he makes the statement that all the string theories predict EP violations. Unfortunately, you don't know how much. <laughs> However, many of them predict violations at higher than the 10 to the minus 20 level, which is where we could get the space experiment. It's a really good space experiment. So is this not a reputation of the Oxford criticism that string theory isn't really science because there's no experiments you could do? I mean, here you're doing an experiment. Um, yeah. You don't know that you don't know that you can get to the level that, that the string theories predict, and I'm sure the string theories are, are not very... So the, 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 now to play the devil's advocate for a position I don't necessarily take, which is that the string theories can't be tested, I could say that the string theories won't make a firm prediction. But we're getting there, right? 